freedom through Christ. And freedom through Christ is, well, it's the ultimate freedom. You know, we can find freedoms through support groups. We can find freedoms through counseling. And all of those things are fantastic. But if we as a church, me as a pastor, don't take time to talk to you about the ultimate freedom, and that is through Christ Jesus. And so I'm going to ask for a little grace over the next couple weeks. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, normally, if you're a part of our community of faith, and which, by the way, if you're online right now or if you're sitting here with us in person and maybe you've only been with us one time, two times, three times, we are so happy that you're with us today. It is just an absolute honor and privilege. And here's what you normally get. Normally when you come to church here at Navigation, uh, there's a couple things that we try to do. And actually, you'll hear this all the time. It's one of our five Ps. Everyone say five Ps. five Ps. So we think in a disciplined life, there's five specific things. You need to have a personal ministry. Why do we invite you to serve in different areas? Because we're just looking for activities for you to do? No, we have found it important over time that when you are serving someone else, it helps put your life into context. And so there's that personal ministry that you need. There's those private devotions that you need. This is great that you're joining us on a Sunday morning, but tomorrow morning is going to show up and I will not be in your bedroom. <laughs> Everyone say Amen. <laughs> I might be peeking in your window, but then we have a whole different issue, right? So, so, but you need to have some personal, you have to have some personal disciplines right then, right? And then, you know, or those private devotions is probably a, a better way to say it. And then um, you, you have to have these disciplines in your life. And then there's other t times and places when it comes to your, um, uh, you have providential relationships. How many have ever ran into someone that you haven't seen for a long time? They said something that almost fed your soul. And it was like, man, I needed to reconnect with them. This providential relationship. And it probably happened in a pivotal moment of your life. Right? You were, gonna, you were trying to decide, am I pivoting towards God in this way or am I pivoting away from God in this way, in this place? And so those are four of them. Well, another one of our P's that we talk about is practical application. I try to, if you go back and listen to every sermon that we've done so far this year, there's a time and a place where I say, here's how you have to practically apply the word to your life because it's one thing to know it, it's another thing to embody it. Well, over these next three weeks, I don't care about any of these. <laughs> Remember, I said, give me a little grace. At no point in today's sermon do I have the thought of, here's your practical application of the word, and here's why. Between this week, next week being Palm Sunday, and then the following week being Easter, I say we do this. Let's just make it all about Jesus. Yes. And if there's, something, if there's something that we can walk away with, fantastic. But if nothing else, if we clear our eyes of religious rituals and just remember who it is we're here talking about, we're just talking about Jesus. And so in order to kind of set this up, I'm going to go, everyone say old school. I'm going to start to this week, next week, and Easter morning with the reading of the word. And if you grew up, okay, we already got, you just told everyone you are old in old school. So like, sorry there, pops. Uh, like, so if you grew up in church or maybe a part of a tradition, you might have heard this before. Would you please stand for the reading of the word? And so I'm just going to invite you. You don't have to do this if you're not a believer in Jesus. And, but I know this. I've watched enough movies where kings and queens walked into the room and people stood to rise. I, I'll promise you this. I'm not telling you if I did or didn't vote for President Biden. I'm not going to tell you if I do or don't like him. I will tell you this, that if he walked into a room that I was in, I would stand in honor of the respect for that place and that authority. And when we read from the word of God today, we just stand in honor. For those in our online campuses, can I ask you also, it may be weird you're at home by yourself, but if you're able to stand for the reading of Mark 14, verses 1 through 11. Now the Passover and the, fe and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away. The chief priest and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and to kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people will riot. While he was in Bethany, reclining at a table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. 
She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wage and the money given to the poor, and they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, Jesus said. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. Verse 8, she did what she could. She poured the perfume on my body. Beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to betray Jesus to them. And they were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. God, I thank you for the reading of the word today. King of kings, Lord of lords, creator of the universe, we ask the same way that this jar was broken to reveal an oil. I ask that the reading of the word is broken over our lives today to reveal the oil, the truth, the living hope that is Christ Jesus. For those of us that have become stagnant in our faith, let this oil become fresh to us today. For those of us that have considered betraying you, Jesus, let us see this act of worship as a way for us to understand the value of who you are. And as we now begin unpacking this word, may it be fresh upon us. We thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated and thank you. You guys know me too well. Already bringing Kleenexes. We just read out of Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 13 was interesting. Mark chapter 13 is known as the Olivet Discord. It's a time that's full of prophetic words. It's a time that ends talking about Jesus coming on a cloud. If I could say it this way, the chapter ends on a very high plane of exaltation towards Jesus. Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 14 then it grabs the reader's attention because it makes a radical shift in the conversation that Mark was recording for us. The mood changes. It's the longest gospel in all of Mark. Theologians call this one Pasius Magnum of Christ, or another way to say it, his grand or great procession, a, pa a passion rooted in suffering. Have you ever been so passionate about something that you hurt inside? Have you ever been so passionate about a task that you were doing that you were losing sleep because you were so driven to get it done? Have you been so passionate about something in your life that everything that used to matter seems to fall aside because you recognize the value of the one thing that matters the most? This is the passion of our Christ leading up, and you've probably heard this phrase before, Passion Week. And it becomes from this thought that Jesus is going to allow everything else in this world to strip down in order for him to move towards his greatest passion, the redemption of all mankind. And it's happening right now in the Feast of Passovers. What is the Feast of Passovers? You may know this already, and if you do, I'm not trying to insult your intelligence. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. The Feast of Passover was a time to remember that God had done it again. The children of Israel, I don't know why I'm emotional. I haven't been emotional all week thinking about this. But the children of Israel were lost in captivity in Egypt. And Moses came and started defeating the Egyptian gods one at a time. Now, you've probably heard it before that there were 10 plagues. Actually, there were 10 victories. There was a God that Moses, one by one, systematically defeated. That way, by the time the final one came, and by the way, this was known as a death angel. 
This is a time that if you are not, if you don't believe in God or you don't believe in Christianity, you could read this part of the Bible and say, man, this is really dark. But I'd like to point out it was filled with hope because Moses, after nine victories, started letting everybody know that on this night, there's going to be a death angel that comes through and it is going to kill the firstborn of everything. But there is a way to overcome this death angel. You need to take a lamb, an innocent lamb, one without spot or blemish, and you need to sacrifice it, then you take the blood and you put it over the doorpost of your house, on the right, the left, and on top. And the angel would then imagine this, come to the house and they would look at it, and that was a sign to say this house is being bought by a blood that doesn't belong to them. What about all the Egyptians? I guarantee the Egyptians knew what the Israelites were up to at this point. And when all of a sudden they're running to the hardware store buying out paintbrushes, the Egyptians would go, why are you getting all these paintbrushes? Well, we're going to paint our doorposts. And, this way. and we also know for a fact, Egyptians left with the Israelites when the mass exodus happened. There had to be salvation for all. And so this time of Passover, but then it was also the time of unleavened bread. And what was unleavened bread? That was because the Israelites, when it was time to go, they didn't have time to let the yeast in their dough to even rise. Because when God calls us to move, we move. We don't say, let something finish until I'm prepared for it. And so this Feast of Unleavened Bread, and there's more to both of these. Please know there's a lot more to both of these. But on both of these, the Jewish people at this time never wanted to forget that God provided a lamb to free them from their sin. And it would come in a moment that they weren't expecting, but were they ready to move in the moment when it came? So Jesus is sitting around with all these, these Sanhedrin. And, and Mark, it's, it's interesting. I did not personally know this. Maybe you do. Mark had a writing style called the sandwich. Now, I don't know. I'm sure there's a bigger, fancier name for it, but this is how I've come to see it. At the beginning, verses 1 and 2, he's talking about how the Sanhedrin and all these lawgivers plotted to kill him. And then the last two scriptures that we read was Judas Iscariot saying that he will do it. And so if you mirror verses 1 and uh, I think it's verse 11, yeah, verse 10, they almost match each other, and 2 and 11 match each other. But then sandwiched in between this is this random story about a woman in an alabaster box. But Mark didn't put a random story in. He was wanting us to know Jesus is going to die. And by the way, he was being prepared for it. Why do I say that? Because out of nowhere, this woman who was at Simon the leper's house, we don't know much about him, but here's what we can kind of uh, conject upon it, is most likely this was someone that Jesus has healed in the past. And Jesus was sitting over at his house. Disciples would have been there. All these other lawgivers, Sanhedrin, religious people were sitting there. And then we know this, that a woman, and, and Mark, it just says a woman, a woman came in to break an alabaster box. But if you would look in the book of John, you would see that this woman was identified as Mary. Now, in case you don't know this, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these are the Gospels. You can, you can find different stories, and sometimes you go, well, they don't quite match up. Actually, they do match up. It's just a different person writing from a different perspective, right? Ask them, uh, I, do I need to give an example of what that means, or are you with me on that one? Different people writing. I, some reason, this elephant example came running through my head. And if you were to ask an eagle and a mouse, Right, and I still don't know why I'm telling you about an elephant. So, okay, so, so you have Mary who came in, this is how we know, and, and we know Mary had a brother named Lazarus, and if you remember Lazarus, he's the one that died. Jesus waited three days to then show up and, and not heal him, bring him back from the dead. Mary also had a sister by the name of Martha. Now, I did a lot of research to try to figure out when Lazarus died compared to this time. And unfortunately, you can't say. There's not a timeline enough in the Bible to say four days earlier, ten days earlier, a month earlier. But you can kind of say it was only a couple weeks earlier. Only a couple weeks earlier, Jesus pulled Lazarus out of the grave. And now you find Mary. Well, who's Mary? 
Well, Mary, we know two things about her because of the scripture. In Luke 10, 38 through 42, there was a time that Jesus came over to their house. Uh, in case you don't know this, Jesus and Mary and Martha and Lazarus, they would have been good friends. These would have been ministry partners, if we could say it this way. If Jesus was in the town, Jesus was stopping by, and Martha was busy running around the house, preparing all the food and getting all, everything ready for the guests, and Mary was just sitting at Jesus' feet, and Martha even said, Jesus, tell her to come help me. There's dishes to do. There's, there's bacon-wrapped Smokies. They wouldn't have been bacon-wrapped Smokies. They're Jewish. I just, that, apparently... That's an appetizer I will eat all the time. So yeah, there is hummus to be hummed. And so like, I need Mary to help me. I need to stick with my notes. Can you always tell when I go random? Like it's pretty obvious, right? Like, remember the whole traditional thing? It's already out the door. So Martha saying, Mary needs to come help me. And Jesus said, Mary has picked the better thing to sit with me. But then we see Mary again. And I would say days before this, She had been home while her brother's coughing, running a high fever, struggling to breathe. And a servant came back and said, don't worry, Jesus said he's on his way. So there, there was a hope that had to be in Mary and Martha's heart. And then the next morning they would wake up and there was no Jesus on the horizon and the brother's doing worse. And this is just me. This is the way I like. Maybe he turns and coughs one time and blood is in the rag. And the fever is to the point where he's hallucinating and they just keep looking out the window. And any second, Jesus is coming. And then all of a sudden, <sighs> there's no more breath. You know how Mary felt because there's been times in your life where your hope died. And we saw one sister that when Jesus, can I say it this way, finally showed up. He finally came. Martha ran out to him, and there's a beautiful conversation between the two. Jesus is this, and oh, I know you're the resurrection, I know you're light, and she's spitting off religious things that her head knew, but there was something in her heart that was still broken. And then Jesus comes to the house where Mary is, and Mary is recorded saying one thing, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't be dead. And nothing else is recorded of what Mary said. How did Mary respond when Lazarus came back from the dead? How did Mary go to Jesus? Did she ever go to Jesus and say, I'm so sorry for the way I treated you. I'm sorry for the way. We don't know anything. Until a little bit later, Jesus is sitting at a house in Bethany. Jesus is sitting in a house in Bethany. Just, first of all, I don't get this. Jesus, the creator of the universe. There are constantly people trying to follow him to take from him. We know for a fact there's people sitting around planning on killing him. Hey, Jesus, what did you do yesterday? Oh, I was building, uh, busy holding the universe together by my will and my word. Hey, Jesus, what do you have planned today? Oh, I'm just planning to atone for the sins of all mankind. Jesus, what do you have on your schedule for tomorrow? Well, that's simple. I'm going to be interceding on behalf of the saints, distributing the gifts to all my ministers. What are you doing in this moment? I'm sitting with my friends. By the way, when I read this part, I had to ask myself, what is my excuse for not spending time with him? Because he always found reasons to spend time with us. Mary, we don't know how, what she went through. We don't know what she processed. We don't know how she responded. But we know this, that she had a perfume valued at 300 denarii. It tells us uh, a year's salary, or basically a denarii was worth a day's page plus the flask that it was being carried in. And many theologians believe that this was an heirloom passed down through her family as one of the most valuable things I could see on this heirloom, Ode Denard. Like, 
I don't think that would sell nowadays. Hey, would you like owe denard? Like, it, it, but you go, how much is a denarii worth? Fantastic question. A denarii is a day's salary. So one of the things I could say to you is, what are you making inside of a year? Could you imagine buying one bottle of perfume worth that price? That helps. So if you make 50000 a year, can you buy a $50,000, 100000 But to put it in context of this day, in Mark, there's a time where Jesus feeds 5,000 people, not counting women and children. And so you could say between 15 and 20,000 people. And the disciples, while they were there, said, we need to send these people away. For us to feed 15 to 20,000 people, it would cost 200 denarii. Hers was worth 300. So let's say it this way, this one bottle of perfume, we could feed everybody within the city of Collinsville a nice meal. That's the value here. You could feed tens of thousands of people for 200, and she broke a jar that was valued at 300. And Mary, I love this, she has this thing of uh, 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 perfume, and it says that she broke in. You would have to know the culture that they're living at this time. Women did not come in to where the men were eating unless they were invited or they were bringing food. I picture this. This is no way the way it happens. I picture Mary coming to the door. It was locked. She took a half a step back and she really put her back into it. She brought her foot up. Bam! Bam! Like, this is how I picture it. <laughs> women, women, can you help me a little bit? Can you just help me a little bit? I don't picture her going, excuse me, Jesus. Excuse. I picture her with the revelation of her brother who drove her to her sitting in the car and go, Mary, what are you up to? She goes, I have to say thank you for you being here. Mary came in and interrupted the meal. And we know this because of the way the men responded. She took this jar and she didn't take time. Have you ever opened up like a Martinelli's or champagne or wine where there's like a cork and you got to undo it and then you got to drip? She cracked that thing. She never planned on bottling back up what she was about to pour out. She didn't plan on holding anything back that she came to sacrifice. She came and broke this bottle and began to dump it over his head. And by the way, you could read in the Bible where it says that this woman washed Jesus' feet and another place where it says she's let out her hair and you go, look, there's inconsistency to the Bible. It's not true. Last week, I had the opportunity with Pastor Aaron and a few other pastors to go to an ordination over in St. Louis. And at the end, we were invited to come up and lay hands. And they put a drop of oil in my hands. And by the way, if you're a pastor, you kind of know the rhythm. You kind of lather up so that you can really do the good hands on. And all I know is I had a drop of oil in my hands. By the time I was done, it covered my hands. By the time I put it on her head and then the 10 other pastors prayed for her, her face was glistening. And that was because of drops. If you were to pour a gallon of olive oil over your head right now, I guarantee your head, your neck, your back, your chest, your hips, your thighs, your feet, your my knee bone connected, my, like all the way down. You're covered. It isn't an inconsistency. It's the different perspective that each writer had. And another way to say it, she covered him from head to toe. Because every part of him was going to be sacrificed for us. Every aspect of who he was was going to be given to us. And what I loved was she predetermined the gift that she planned on bringing I have to ask myself again, when I come to church on Sunday morning, do I predetermine the gift that I'm going to bring or do I wait to see if the band's good enough? Do I predetermine that I'm going to hear the word of God that day? And you might go, well, pastor, you're the one preaching. Ask anyone in my family. I listen to a sermon before I ever get here. 
I allow someone else to preach and I listen and it has nothing to do with the conversation I'm going to have with you. It's just me trying to hear something else. But do I listen to say, do they entertain me enough? Was pastor funny enough? Did he give me a practical example that I could personally benefit from? Or do I come predetermined? I'm going to hear what the word of God has to say and I'm going to let it cut me and divide my soul and flesh. Do you come saying, I'm going to serve? Well, if there's a big enough need, maybe they can get me. Or if it's something that I feel comfortable with. I'm not done here. You know why? Because she wasn't done here. Oh, I may connect into one of the the community group if it fits in my schedule, but I don't really like going to meet new people and I may be uncomfortable. You know what? I'm pretty sure right now was an uncomfortable time for everybody sitting in this room. And here's the crazy thing. The disciples are missing what's happening because the reason they miss them, and this is just my opinion, I think they had become comfortable with Jesus. They had been traveling with him for three years. Do you think they were as excited about this miracle as they were three years ago? Or did they get to the point of, yeah, it's what he does. Hey, we need food. We need money. How are we going to get it? Pull a fish out, and when you do, it'll have a coin in its mouth. Yes, this is what we read in our Bible. Do you think when next time they needed money, they were worried about it? Next time they needed food, they were worried about it? But Jesus was consistently saying to them, I am on my way to die. The problem is they were with him for so long, they couldn't hear the new thing that he was trying to say. And the difference between them and this woman, they were comfortable with what they were always bringing. She brought something new and heard something new. If you are stagnant in your faith, well, this church just doesn't feed me anymore. What are you bringing to him? Maybe you bring something to him and see if something new isn't revealed to you. She predetermined. And then these guys in protest, why this fragrant perfume was wasted like this. We could have, all of this was wasted. And Jesus goes, no, no, no. If you knew my passion, it wasn't wasted at all. If you knew who this was and you knew what he was doing, the only question we could beg to ask is why did she bring so little? Pure nard. What people would do with this bottle is they would dilute it in order for it to expand longer. They would put the uh, pure nard into different vessels, then they would dilute it, and this smell could last for longer. But here's the thing, it wouldn't last forever. Where are we diluting our gift to God? Where are we diluting what we're bringing to him? In order for it to stretch a little bit further, in order to feel like we've done a little bit more versus dumping out all of who we are. They could have fed, this could have bring a cost of 300 denarii. I find it interesting and just know that I'm taking the Bible out of context. Everyone hear this? You, you gotta hear this. This is, just, this is the way I'm reading it. I would never preach it as far as the Bible says this, but I find it interesting that she had 300 denarii and she gave it to Christ, but then Judas was willing to sell him out for 30, which is a tenth or a tithe of what this was. Now, I'm not trying to say Judas stole the tithe. You gotta hear me. I don't, I'm not, I, I cannot take the Bible out of context, but I find it so interesting that these two numbers are, are parallel to each other. We could have given it to the poor, but he, another way to say it is one tells their love for Jesus at the cost of a heavy price. The another tells a tale of an unspeakable treachery and betrayal. And the untreachery and betrayal was a tithe or a tenth of what her gift was. What is it that we bring to him? And then it says that they were just enraged. This is actually a poor translation in the Bible. By the way, I'm back on to what the Bible actually says. Everyone follow me there? It says that they were angry at her. This is a, this is a poor translation, but we can't do word for word translation on this one. Have you ever seen a bullfighter before where they're in a coliseum and the bull's on the other side and toro, toro, you know? I don't know why I had the accent. It just showed up. It's, you heard it, right? And then all of a sudden that bull puts his head down and starts like hitting his hoof 
and the nose flares. This is the picture of the word here. They head down, anger filled, nostrils flared, begin to say, how could she do this? This is the anger that they had in this moment. It was, I can't believe they wasted that on this poor guy. Like, you know, it was venom. It was hostile. It was vein up the neck, pulsing in the, you know what I'm talking about. No, how could she do this? Like, da, da, da. And Jesus says, stop it. See, when the first time I read it, I think I read it like there was an exclamation point. But I don't think Jesus could have said, hey, what she did was a good thing. I think Jesus had to respond with, What she did was a good thing. Because Jesus knows this is preparation for his burial. And the Sanhedrin that have kept the faith for all these years have missed it. The disciples that have walked with him for all these months and all this time, this season, they seem to be missing it. But there was one woman who witnessed the resurrection. Her passion overtook her personality and her preferences at this point. Her passion overtook her personality. What was her personality to quietly sit at his feet? What was her personality to sulk in the corner when she was disappointed? Boom, not this day. Your passion overtook her personality. Her preference would be for everyone to like her and not to disturb all the men in the room because that's what protocol on that day said. But the problem was oh, there had to be something. If we seek to please man, then God will never be satisfied with us. We have to break through that. Jesus said, let her alone. She's done a good work for me. You know what she couldn't do? She couldn't stop Judas from betraying him. She couldn't raise an army to go against the Romans. She couldn't change the mind of the powerful Sanhedrin. She was powerless in changing the world, but the one thing that she had the ability to do was to worship her Savior. Feel free to get online and keep posting about everything or worship your Savior. Feel free to get in arguments with idiots that never change. Am I, can, can I just say it? If you have one person that's ever changed their mind online because of a post, let me know. But at some point, you're going to the swamp thinking you're going to get a clean drink of water. Or we could just worship our Savior. We could bring to Him the gift worthy of His name. And so she did, and here's what He did. And by the way, I know that I've read this passage a minimum of 22 plus times. Why? Because I've been a pastor for over 22 years, and I guarantee every Easter I read this. I've never seen this before. Where Jesus said, wherever this gospel, which by the mean, way means the good news, wherever this is preached from now on, everyone is going to know your story. She went down in history because she was the one person that heard what the Savior was saying. And the Holy Spirit must have moved on her in order to be a part of the preparation for the redemption of mankind. How impactful was this moment? It's not wasted. So I told you, I didn't have practical application for you. <clears throat> told you, when it comes to your personal disciplines and your, or your private devotions and personal ministry. Hopefully, I've been your providential relationship to shift something in your thinking. But I guess there is one thing that we need to think about. If you look at the account of all the Gospels that wrote about this, we're pretty sure this can be said. She came in and broke the jar and poured it on his head. At some point, she knelt down in front of him because the oil had made his way to his feet. She took her hair down and began washing his feet, 
which by the way tells us that when Jesus came into this man's house, they didn't even honor him enough to do that. So she is washing off the residue of mankind to make this the perfect lamb. And here's the one thing as I read this that I know for certain that she walked out that day smelling just like he did. Other people in that house smelled of him. She smelled like him. There were other people that may have saw what had happened, but she was soft with what was happened. There were other people that might have remembered what has occurred. She walked out with the tangible touch of what had occurred. In this season of passion leading into Easter, this is the question I'm going to ask for me. You decide if you need to have it for yourself. But do I smell like Jesus? Do I smell like the Savior? Do I smell like someone willing to give their life for someone else? Because by the way, we're not just called to be holy. We're not just called to look like Jesus. We're called to be like Jesus. And if Jesus gave his life for someone else, the minimum that we should be able to do is to give our life for someone else. And you don't do that smelling like everyone else around us. We do that because we smell like Christ. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, let your oil pour out today. If you're sitting here with us now, if you're in our online campus, this may be weird to you. But if you just even want to like extend your hand out, like if I, I was going to say, I have a gift for you. If you just want to kind of hold your hands out like this and just say, God, I want to smell like you today. I want to be so close to your passion, God, that when the oil breaks, I'm going to receive... And rather than taking it and applying it to myself, God, I'm going to use it to wash the feet of someone else. To wash off the muck and mire of humanity that is attached to us. God, I receive today the essence of who you are so that when I go to work tomorrow, people say something smells different about you. Something looks different about you. And I can say, there's a new and living hope. Hallelujah. To the one who set us free. Hallelujah. God, may we recognize the days ahead of us for the value that they are. That you are li living hope. If you're here today and you have your eyes closed, please just, I, I, I have to give this invitation. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, if you're in our online community, this man that I've been talking about all day, just in a couple days from now, hangs on a cross, his body torn, I, I want to say torn to pieces, that's not quite accurate, his flesh was. Crown of thorns jammed on his head. Brutally crucified. But then he went into a grave for three days without life, without breath, without a heartbeat. But we find out that three days later, not even death can hold back the victorious king that we serve. And Jesus himself came walking out and he died for your sins if you're here today and you don't know jesus christ is your personal lord and savior if i've been talking today and you don't even fully understand it but your heart is racing so there's something inside of your stomach going no this is right this is the answer i've been looking for this is the freedom that i've been craving they have an answer in this building it's not this building and it's not me it's the one i've been talking about and that's named jesus christ 
If you're here today with all eyes closed and head bowed, if you're in our online campus and you're ready to say yes to Jesus Christ being your Lord and Savior, could I just ask you to boldly put your hand into the air so that I can see that you made that decision today. And as hands are going up in this room, as decisions are happening online, online, raise your hand. Now that may be hitting a like button because of a comment that just got thrown in, a tab that popped up in front of you. All of that is to say that you are believing in your heart. That's why we raise our hand. I see those hands here. We believe it in our heart. Now it says in our word to confess with your mouth. Could everyone say this prayer with me? Dear Jesus, I have heard and I'm going to respond. Forgive me of my sins. Become Lord of my life. From this day forward, I turn to follow you. God, I thank you for every hand that went up. I thank you for every mouth to confess. Maybe for the first time, but this is the last time. Because our saving grace, we receive your faith today. And we become followers of who you are. Thank you for this fresh oil. Thank you for this fresh word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on. Let's put our hands together and celebrate for those.